Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Mike Okoche. Now, Africa is often seen as a metaphor that describes an unfortunate collision between the best life can offer and the worst situation anyone can imagine. Blessed with immense human and natural resources, the continent has a persistent history of crisis and insurgency in the midst of poverty. At this year's International Day of Peace was a chance for citizens of crisis-ridden nations in Africa to reflect on the need for peaceful coexistence that has eluded the region for decades. Now, what would it take to find lasting peace in Africa? You can join the conversation and share with us on Twitter at TVC Africa Today. We'll take a report now and Africa Today will continue. Welcome on board. This is a group of journalists stepping up to address the role in peace building among Somalians days ahead of the International Peace Day. The discussions were led by journalists under the umbrella body, the National Union of Somali Journalists, NOSOJ, and attracted representatives of the media the federal government, women, the youth, and members of civil society from different parts of the country. Participants discuss how they can lead a movement that advocates for unity and reconciliation, raise awareness among the Somali people, as well as call for individual actions that will promote peace across Somalia. The discussions also looked at ways in which the media can use their work to support the stabilization process in the country and use journalism as a tool for peace. Speaking during the dialogue, Mohamed Ibrahim Bakistan, Secretary General, Somali Journalists National Union, said the media has and we continue to play a central role in ensuring peace in Somalia. The Somali journalists have been in the lead uh, for taking the campaigns for peace uh, for a long time. It's not something that has just started. Uh, Actually, for the last 22 years, there has been anarchy, warlords, religious warlords, terrorism, piracy. But the media has been a model for, uh, you know, uh, campaigning for peace. And uh, what we believe is that uh, without the media campaign for peace, I think that, uh, you know, a uh, sustainable peace in Somalia has, has not been reached. Hawa Lul, a female journalist with Komi Radio, emphasized the importance of the media in ensuring that the divergent views of the Somali society are shared and accommodated. Journalists in Somalia are major victims of war, with many killed in the course of their work. Participants agreed that peace is vital for a free media to function in any country. With the ability to reach millions of Somalians through radio, television and the internet, the media has the power to influence a nation positively or negatively. Amina Hamid, Africa Today. All right, September the 21st of every year is marked as International Peace Day around the world. Coincidentally, this year's observance also made it a year since the Westgate Mall terror attack happened in Kenya, in which about 67 people were killed and hundreds of others injured. Now, joining us in Africa today, we have Tosin Akonde, a lawyer and a political analyst. You're welcome to Africa today. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's really good to see you. Same here. <laughs> And on Skype, we have Dr. John Mbaku of the Brookings Institution in the United States of America. Welcome to the program, Dr. John. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Okay, let, let's start from the studio. Uh, Conde, uh, Con if you have to, if we make comparison between now and decades back, would you say Africa is better off in the context of being peaceful? Uh, well, um, I think uh, my take on that yeah. is that uh, it's like um, having to choose between the devil and the dead blue sea. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's, 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 it's fair compared to a few years back. You know, as for instance, as at 1998, there was a major UN report on African conflicts. Yeah. And um, it was revealed to us that um, between 1998 I'm oh, sorry, as of 2010, I'm sorry now. Mm. Now, between 1998 and 2010, war conflict zones in Africa dropped from 14 to mere four. Right. But I'm sure that between 2010 and now, too, there has been a slight increase exactly. following the independence of South Sudan from Sudan mm. and then the incessant you know, conflicts between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Mm. So, and a few other you know, insurgencies here and there. So, but by and large, it, it's, it's all right, much better than before when it was a prevalence of military 
you know, rulership almost mm -hmm. on the entire continent of Africa. But now with the nascent democracy emerging here and there, you know, I think some of these African governments are picking one or two things. All right. Uh, basically, what makes it so difficult to find lasting peace on the African continent? Because year in, year out, you must hear of a crisis or some kind of insurgency or some kind of violence in one part of the continent or the other. You certainly don't often <laughs> hear that in Europe. You certainly don't often hear that in, uh, in, uh, in South America or even in America, as the case may be. But you've always heard that idiomatic expression that you don't put a round um, peg in a square hole mm. or you don't do the bicep visa. Okay. All right. Now, um, that is what happens. It's, um, it was rehearsed way back in 1884. Oh. I'm talking about the Berlin Conference okay. where strangers came to Africa and partitioned Africa amongst themselves purely for commercial interests. So what do you expect? It was a time bomb. So much of these things were programmed to happen. The, the West, most times, have always been paying lip service to genuine problems consult and confronting Africa. And it must be learned that much of their resources with which they built the skyscrapers in mm. New York and London, you know, and the Eiffel Tower and so on and so forth in Paris, France, and other Western powers of the world came from here. Mm. So it's, 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 it's expected. I'm not surprised, for instance, that it appears as if the problems of Africa in terms of conflicts appear intractable. Hmm. All right. It's quite interesting. I'd like to come back to this issue again. But uh, let, let's have uh, uh, Dr. John Baku with us right now. Dr. John, it's good to have you on Africa today. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, most parts of the continent have been caught up in a cycle of violence for decades. Now, how did Africa get to this point in the first place? I think uh, there, there are a lot of reasons, but I think one of the most important is that um, colonialism did not intend to establish institutions in Africa that would provide opportunities for people to live together peacefully. Unfortunately, when many, many countries in the continent gained independence, there, there wasn't that much emphasis on institutional construction in trying to figure out what kinds of institutions were there that could allow people to live together peacefully. As a matter of fact, most Af a lot of African countries simply adopted the institutions that had been left over from colonialism and made very little interest in trying to re-examine to see whether those institutions were appropriate for uh, uh, peaceful coexistence or not. And so as a result, what, ha what you see now in the continent is that you have, you have uh, people living together who are not able to resolve the conflicts peacefully. As a result, you have a lot of violence, uh, very little emphasis on economic growth and economic development. Uh, government policies are distorted in favor of urban areas the rural areas are left uh, fending for themselves. Uh, public policies usually favor rich, the rich, and the poor are left fending for themselves. Uh, the government is incapable of uh, handling even simple issues that come up on a daily basis. Uh, we can see the problems that are occurring in uh, uh, places like uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea the total lack of the ability of the government to be able to deal with sim simple uh, healthcare issues. I, so I think that one of, the prob one of the things that we need to really sit down and seriously think about is how to come up with institutions, with structures, legal institutions, judicial institutions, government institutions that can allow the various groups that uh, reside within each country to be able to resolve the problems peacefully and as a result live together peacefully. If we are not able to do that, I don't think we can achieve peace in any country in the continent. All right, Dr. Mbaku, you mentioned colonialism, but colonialism in Africa was about 50 years or over 50 years ago. How long do we keep blaming colonialism for the wars or the crisis in Africa? Well, uh, I'm not blaming colonialism. I'm just explaining uh, uh, why we are where we are today. Okay. Uh, the, the thing is, why, on the other hand, we shouldn't blame colonialism, we cannot ignore colonialism because colonialism introduced a lot of institutions in Africa that still remain today. Take, for example, the issue of language. Uh, in many African countries, uh, Cameroon, for example, 
French and English are used as national languages. Mm. Unfortunately, less than 15% of the people in the country uh, speak French or English. And so when the government wants to communicate with the people, it tries to communicate in French and English. Unfortunately, most people don't even understand any of those languages. So uh, yes, it is true that we cannot continue to blame colonialism, but we have to take into consideration the fact that many of the institutions that, that now control our lives in Africa are based on uh, European models. Uh, uh, the Francophone countries, for example, in 1958, except for Guinea, all the Francophone countries adopted the French constitution of 1958 as a model for their institutions, even though the problems that existed in, in, uh, in, in those countries at the time had very little relevance to what was going on in France when the French developed their uh, constitution. And those constitutions, those institutions that were created out of those constitutions remain the essential institutions that govern these countries today. And I think that's part of the problem. We have to be serious about reconstruction and, and sit down and ask ourselves, how are we going to uh, govern ourselves? What kinds of institutions are appropriate for countries in Africa? instead of relying on European institutions, because I think this is the beginning of the problem. Let me ask you the same question before I go back to the earlier point you were making. Okay. Now, we, the, there's often very strong worded speeches from leaders and players on the international scale when it comes to summits of, of the, that, that try to find lasting peace on the African continent. But we often don't see the translation of those speeches, strong speeches to execution of peace on the continent. Well, I think the question you have just um, asked mm. is a source of major concern even to the UN authorities. Okay. I could recall in one of the reports submitted by the, the UN SecGen, I'm mm. talking about Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Yeah. He said, he, he had a coinage for it, he said, resource mismatch. Okay. He said, <laughs> people come and mm. make pledges, say speeches, mm. only not to be able to advance the funds mm. they have promised with which peacekeeping missions all over the world are being exercised or carried out. So it is the human tendency. You understand? It, th that's what I was saying when you, the first question you, you, you asked me, I said, there is a tendency for Western powers to pay lip service to the genuine development of Africa. It appears as if they even fuel. Not only it appears, I know, but most of them are behind some of the problems and some of these conflicts. I'll give you a cue. The Westgate attack we've talked about, of course, fingers have been uh, directed and pointed at the Israeli government. I, I hope you are aware that there is a tendency, I mean, there is a report that, look, Israel and Kenya, for instance, have signed a security pact. This security pact happens to be a threat to their neighbors, including Somalia. And they are of the opinion, the Somali forces now, uh, Mogadishu is saying that, look, these people have come into our territory mm. to carry out military operations. Yeah. So the Westgate attack actually is even seen as a reprisal attack, okay. which is legitimate in international law. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll come back to this issue. Now, some say developed nations of the world ignore the warning signs many months ago and missed the chance to prevent the chaotic situation in parts of Africa. Uh, today is another opportunity to bring the crisis to an end. But how ready is humanity in giving peace a chance? We'll go on a quick break and Africa Today will continue. Stay with us. Right, for many, a wider perspective of Africa gives a narrow impression of conflict all over the continent. Militants are on rampage in North Africa. There is a war going on in Central Africa. Terrorism is a threat in East Africa. And now we have insurgency in West Africa and an uneasy calm in Southern Africa. But coming into the millennium, there was a lot of projection that this is the millennium for Africa. There were so many projections, Africa is going to develop this way and so on. But with all this crisis and so on, what kind of impact has it had on the growth generally? Obviously, it has had a negative impact because uh, even like we, 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 I kept on stressing that even at the United Nations level, at the regional, you know, uh, sub-regional levels, um, level of ECO ECOWAS, I'm talking about the AU and so many other ones, the EEC, East African and so on and so forth, they all have the opinion 
that there cannot be true development except there is peace. Mm. So we need to create a conducive atmosphere that will facilitate economic development and growth. For, Ni for instance, again, Nigeria, I was looking at the, uh, the, the index okay. that is used to you know, um, decide which countries, uh, countries ranking, okay. according to the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Yeah. You know Mo Ibrahim? Yeah, of course. That big boy, yeah. you know. <laughs> now, Mo Ibrahim's um, <laughs> foundation placed Nigeria on number 41, mm. and so many criteria, factors such as, you know, unemployment rate, mm. youth restiveness, you know, um, infrastructural presence, and so on and so forth. If these things are not on ground, people have a tendency to grow restive to become aggressors, to become trouble, troublemakers. Here and there. So it will bounce back on the economy. All right. Now, Africa, Africans are generally said to be very religious people. And all the religions preach very much, uh, project peace and preach peace. Yeah. Now, what is the role of religion to ensuring there's peace on the continent? Ah, that, that, that's a tough one. <laughs> but, but then I'll try. Uh, for instance, I am a Christian. Mm. But... Um, I follow the dictates of the holy books. Mm. I don't, a lot of Africans have a problem with the religion they profess. Mm. You know, most of them are do as we hear, don't do as it is written mm. in the okay. holy books. So whether you are a Muslim, a Christian, a paganist, an atheist, or wh whatever it is, Buddhist, whatever it is of the world religions that you profess, there is no religion that forbids good nature. Good nature facilitates the peace we are talking about, which appears to be elusive. Some of the problems that generate these conflicts are just selfishness, greed on the part of the leadership, for instance. And so if religion is now being, you see, don't give a dog a bad name that you may hang it. I would not want to lay the blame on religion. It's still about the people because I know that good nature stems from within. It's not about religion. So you could be a paganist and be a good man. You could be a Muslim and be a good man. You, you could be a Taoist mm. and be whatever it is that you, yeah, but, it's but about I, your nature yes, inside. But, yeah, but I like to draw it from, if, if, uh, narrow it down to the li religious leaders. Often, because if you see, if you see, religion is a tool where people don't question whatever their religious leaders tell them, and that's the problem. Uh, uh, that's fine, the problem. Fine. So I, I like to draw it to the religious leaders where they stand because they have a lot of influence on the people. Now, if we have to take it to the Central African Republic, we saw the, the problem between the Seleka rebel and the, and the anti-Balaka, yeah. which, which turned into a religious issue, the Islam. And, but they have religious leaders who direct people, talk to people, and they have a large number of followership. So how come the leaders don't have that kind of influence on the people when it comes to telling them not to go into violence? Well, um, that is where um, I have reservations mm. about how people carry about religion. Right. As a Christian, I know that in, in the Bible, Isaiah 1, 18, the Spirit of God was, I don't want to go religious because mm. this is an international matter, <laughs> yeah, but course. then let, let me quote the Bible here. It says, come and let us reason. Mm. If God, as high and mighty as he is, could be saying to me, a mere mortal, Come, let us think and reason. I ask questions, hard questions, and I get answers yeah. because my Christian faith makes me to believe that there is something, a concept, the concept of the Holy Spirit, which ministers to me. And that spirit tells me, forbid mm. violence. So and then I eschew violence. Because I don't do all, it. I don't all, do all, it. All religions is set, certainly preach Islam, peace. Islam, for instance, means peace. Yeah, it's a religion of peace. Mm. And that's what some people are saying. If we come down home to Nigeria, mm. talking about Boko Haram, exactly. they say, look, that's not an Islamic agenda. They have, they have demarcated, they have delineated the line, saying that, look, this one is, is dastardly evil. Islam is a religion of peace. I believe so, too. Mm. For instance, Arabic, which is the hallmark of nations that profess Islam, Arab, Arabic language, was one of the languages spoken in the Bible when the Holy Spirit manifested amongst the people, Acts chapter 2. Hmm. So I know what I'm talking about. There is no religion. It's just, it's people, when they want to achieve selfish desires, they put religion aside. Uh, it's, it's, it's the norm. If you see some people, they say, look, let us put born again aside. Hmm. That is the human nature. Genesis 6, 6, 
God said clearly that after he has made us and he has seen the works of our hands, he got sad. All, all right, let's, 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 let's deviate from religion now I'll, I'll <laughs> and bring you back that. home. Honestly, uh, the the point there is, you, you, have, you have enumerated several issues. From the standpoint where we are now, is Africa helpless when it comes to finding peace on the continent? It appears so. Because um, much of uh, when peace, when conflict uh, becomes fully blown mm. on the African continent, um, much of the logistics that we need are, have never been generated from within. They still come from outside. Mm. These people even describe and define for us what name we should call our conflicts. I'll give you an, ex an, an instance. Belligerency and insurgency are two similar and related terms. But they will tell you that whatever sanction, whatever conflict that is solid enough to attract the, the, the mercy or the attention of the United Nations is belligerency. Which other one that is not strong enough to attract their attention is insurgency. So sometimes I laugh because this is international law. When in the, media, the Nigerian media, for instance, they say the Boko Haram insurgency, the Boko Haram insurgency, I believe it is ripe enough for foreign aid to come into Nigeria and help us out with these things. Because the, 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 the issue of Chibok girls is still germane. How can we have such number of young, innocent girls? Who knows which, which of those girls could become the first female Nigerian president? Mm. So these are issues that, for me, I see as defining moment of Africa's helplessness. All right. Now, the violence on the continent is certainly said to be very distracting to developmental efforts of the yes. African leaders. Now, seeing it from the leader's perspective, are they doing enough to ensure there is peace even before the take a step towards ensuring that they put uh, uh, machineries together for growth? For me, they are not doing enough. Mm. For me, the reason why I'm here particularly today is to draw it into the attention of these people that instead of being so adept at conflict um, um, resolution, let's do conflict preventive mechanisms. Because obviously to end wars, to end armed conflicts requires so much money, which is even a rarity on the African continent. Much of African nations are poor. In fact, to maintain a regular peacekeeping mission requires a lot of money, both from the United Nations and from the AU. So if you don't have money to, and that's why some wars appear you know, prolonged. We don't have the solid financial base to put a one-stop end to much of these conflicts. And who bears the brunt the most? Children and women. Mm. So if you've noticed that is the trend, the pattern in which these conflicts are going, then instead of allowing the conflict to start in the first place, why not stop it, nip it in the board and prevent it? So that's why I like the step taken by the AU, for instance. You know, when we created the AU in 2002, 2003, we have various organs. We have the Peace and Security Council, but that's not even the meat for the people. Mm. The thing the people need to know is about the African spirit of resolving conflicts, which is the security, the com there's a committee of, you know, the wise. Okay. You know, Africans believe that old people, mm. they the have elder, that elders. sagacity, elders, <laughs> yes, they have the wisdom. It's even said in, in Africa that when an old man dies here in Africa, it's like a library set ablaze in mm. Europe. So we don't joke with wisdom from the elders and we have something like that in place for this AU and mm. which is a good one. But then on paper, it's been working on paper only. Mm. In practice, not much has been achieved. All right. Now, b before we go, if, if steps have to be taken now to restore peace to Somalia, restore peace to South Sudan, Central African Republic, Mali, Egypt. Nigeria, Egypt, Libya, as yes. the case may be, what kind of, I know there are different uh, dimensions to all of these things, but Africa yeah. is one. What kind of steps should be taken to restore peace generally? Well, um, we, we can't discuss um, Africa's problems without uh, engaging Africans. Okay. And all categories of people in Africa, we have the academic groups, for instance, the ivory towers should be doing a great job. Mm. The professors, where are they? They should come out and start pontificating. We have um, the civil society groups. They should keep engaging the government. Then what the AU has done with respect to the committee on five of the wise, the, um, the five, um, five wise elders and the Peace and Security Council, they should be encouraged. You know, we, we need to promote um, that we drive strong institutions. Leadership is not about the person. Unfortunately, in this part of the world, until we change that mentality, everything in Nigeria, everything in Africa needs to be on auto drive, such that when the leader exits, the system, you know, the succession plan and everything can sustain itself. 
So we need to talk about the moral aspect of leadership. Some of the causes of this conflict are not just what, are brought up, what, what has been brought upon us by either colonialism or neocolonialism. It's out of the weakness, tragic flaw of some leaders, the leadership flaw, which some of these Western powers find the embers of such, you know, such weaknesses. They promote it. They, 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 they tell them, look, you can actually do this. You can actually do that. And these are things that are contrary to the collective aspirations of the African people. It's all right, Tosin Akondi. Thank you very much for it's coming in Africa today. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And we also thank Dr. John Mbaku for joining us earlier on from the United States. Although everyone has a right to peace, it has been a battlefield of the mind for the continent where you have terrorists, widespread corruption, economic inequality, and social exclusion all in one place. The world must stand together for Africa to silence the voice of extremism and tackle the root causes of conflict, as this will create a legacy of peace and save future generations from the pestilence of war. That's our show for today, but the conversation continues on Twitter at TVC Africa Today. I am Mike Okwache, and remember, this is Africa. Bye for now.